Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Come on, why don't you look at the person sitting next to you and tell them, say, I'm so glad you made it to church. Now look at the other person, tell them, say, you need some church. I know you. You need this. How many of you love your senior pastors? You love Pastor John, John and Elena? Come on, you can do better than that. You guys have some of the best, uh, best pastors. You know, I, um, as Pastor John John said, about a year ago we met. And, um, and I, I've been coming to the city for, uh, for probably five or six years. Um, and, I, and, and, and my heart has just grown for the city. And uh, the first time I ever came to the city, I actually, I didn't love the city. It was raining, and I heard it was supposed to be uh, sunny in, in California, and it was raining. And I was like, this, I don't think this is California. This seems like the South, and, you know. And, uh, and so I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't really fall in love with the city the first time I came. Um, but more and more trips that I made out here, man, God just began to just do something in my heart uh, for this city and for the people of this city. And, uh, and over the last few years, as God's began to grow a heart, uh, for this city and for the people of this city, um, I just began to try to connect with as many pastors as possible, and and I've met quite a few pastors in the Bay Area, um, but you know I I haven't met in um, all the pastors that I've met. And I'm trying to say this with all respect and honor. Um, I, I haven't met a pastor like your pastor in this city. Your your pastor is the, one of the most kingdom minded uh, men of God that I've ever met, and. Uh, from the moment when I first had the first conversation with him, I sensed it. I felt it. I felt it, John. John, I felt like this this guy, it's not about the name on the sign of the church. It's about the name of Jesus. It's not about some little kingdom that a local church is trying to build, but it's about building God's kingdom. I felt that uh, from him. And, uh, and and it's more than just words from him. He, uh, he he has, he has spoken life and spoken words, but he's invested in me. Your church, even this opportunity today is an investment uh, into our church and into our leadership. And I'm very, very thankful for him. I met with one pastor, uh, and, and he, it felt like he was discouraging me from coming to the city. Then I meet with your pastor. He's like, hey, what do we need to do to get you here? That's what kind of pastor you have. You need to know that. that you guys are blessed with amazing leadership. Uh, and I'm so grateful and so thankful for your friendship, man. I know that uh, that, that God brought us together, and I just consider you a brother, man. So why don't we clap our hands for your senior pastors one more time. <clears throat> and um, I, I, I didn't have this written down in my notes, uh, but during worship, God, I was just moved, man. Such amazing presence of God here. The worship is phenomenal. But God reminded me um, that I have been here. I, I came and visited, uh, I don't know how many months ago, maybe six months to a year ago. But even before I, I came here to this church in person, I came here in prayer. I've been praying for you. you. You didn't know this. I've been praying for you for over a year now. Not, not just like praying generally for San Francisco. I've been praying for City Life Church for over a year now. You didn't know that, but I've been here. I've been, I've been stalking you in prayer. My wife bought me this thing called Aqua Notes because I pray in the shower. That's like my space. Just lock the door, keep the kids out. Nobody bother me. It's just me and the Holy Ghost in my shower. And I have something called Aqua Notes, and I write, I write down sermons, entire sermons on the wall of my shower. I write down people I'm praying for. Let me tell you this. I, 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 when it came through my mind, it was awkward at first, so I had to think through my wording of this because at first uh, I thought, man, I, I've, I've had city life in the shower with me, and that didn't sound right. And so I had to think through the way I was going to say this. Um, but I have ha I've had you in front of me in my time of prayer and interceding for this city. I prayed specifically for your church, that God would bless your church, that God would, he would shine his favor upon your, sh your church, that God would open up doors for your church, that the kingdom of God would be in expanded because of your leadership, because of your generosity, because of your serve in this city. And so you need to know I've been here in prayer before I ever came in person. And I love you guys. It's an honor to get to be here and to get to serve. This is my first time to preach in San Francisco in the city. So we're going to turn up at City Life Church. I'm from the south, from the dirty south. Anybody from the south here? Anybody? We got a couple of southern people. Come on, girl. We got some people from the south. In the south, we turn up when we go to church. I don't know about in San Francisco if you guys turn up. but Will you preach back at me as I preach? Okay. At the right place, at the right place. I will preach better and quicker if you will shout me down while I preach. We will get to the restaurant. We will we'll go eat some good food if you just help me preach today. I came with my wife and my, my kids. My wife's sitting right here on the front row. She's so fine. She's so good looking. Say, girl. 
name is Jennifer. We just waved at everybody. She said, please don't make me stand up. So, so but we've been married now for 11 years. May made 11 years, uh, and we've been dating for almost 20 years. I know you're like, when y'all start dating? When you're like one years old? Uh, no, but we were in, she was in, we were in junior high when we, uh, when we got married, or when we got married, when we started dating. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> uh, so we, we, were, we were dating. We started dating in junior high, and uh, we dated through high school and through college. And then uh, in, in um, 2004, she was on a mission trip in Milan, Italy. And so I went and got a ring, and I flew to Milan, Italy, and found her. Some of you single brothers in the house, listen, you scoping and hoping, you better take notes right now. Take notes, my brother. But I flew to, to Italy, and I knew, man, that was like, that's a romantic place, right? So I flew to Italy, and I, I found her, and I got under a little willow tree, and I got down on one knee, and she came running over to me, and she begged me to marry her. <laughs> and uh, I said, girl, I'm going to spend the rest of my life with you. And so, man, we got married and, um, in 2005. A few years later, we started having kids. I, I brought some pictures. Do you, have a, a, do you have those pictures? I don't know if, if you're able to get those pictures or not. Can you see that? Look, this is Liam right here. He's in, he's in kids' church this morning. We took this picture yesterday. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Uh, but that's Liam. He's smiling and running, kind of doing the Heisman. Uh, he wants to play for the 49ers, y'all. <clears throat> he said, Dad, can I play for, for Golden State, for LSU Tigers, and for the 49ers? And I'm like, son, you can do whatever you want. <clears throat> and then the other one in the back, look, that, that's, this is a close-up of him. That's Nixon. He's going to be, he may be a worship leader here at City Life Church if y'all take him. But uh, he's back there right now. And uh, I don't know if you guys have another, you have another little picture of him? This is them together right here. Isn't that great? So uh, if you have a daughter uh, and you want to put her name on the list, um, we are praying about uh, arranged marriages. And so, Awesome. Well, if you have your Bibles, why don't you go with me over to uh, Deuteronomy chapter number one. And uh, if you want to, you can flip over to Numbers 13. I don't know if we'll read the verses from Numbers 13 and 14, but it's essentially it's the same story. Numbers 13 and 14 is like real time. And then Deuteronomy 1 is 40 years later. Moses is looking back. And so we'll just capture some of the verses in Deuteronomy chapter one. But I do bring greetings on behalf of our pastors, Pastor Robert and Debbie Morris. Uh, from Dallas, Texas, a, a church called Gateway Church. Uh, you guys know Gateway Church, and, and so uh, it is a blessing to get to be there with them. Jennifer and I have been there now for about three years, helping them with their student ministry, and they're going to be sending us to plant a church uh, here in the city and hopefully in the Bay Area. We just want to come and serve people. We're not trying to build a, uh, build, build a church that's just some huge church. We're just coming here to serve people. And uh, we're just saying, God, obedience is on us. Outcomes are on you. We just want to love and serve the city. We want to love and serve people. It's not about us changing people. You change people. We just serve people. We love people. We want to build your house, build your kingdom. It's not just about our church. It's about your church. It's about building the body of Christ in this city. And so we're really excited to get to do that. And Gateway is going to be sending us here to be able to do that. And so you'll be hearing more about that through either Pastor John, John, or you can keep up with us. But if you have your Bibles, Deuteronomy chapter 1. This is, sorry I have this big old computer up here. My iPad died, and so I got to go old school and preach from a, from a laptop. Um, but uh, th this, is, this, is, uh, this is, again, this is in Deuteronomy 1. This is where Moses is now, uh, it's been 40 years since they've been delivered out of Egypt. He was the leader that God brought in, the chosen man of God that God sent in to bring them out. He sent them, it's a type of Christ coming into the world to bring us out of slavery and bondage. And God sends Moses into Egypt and he delivers the people, you know, let my people go, you know the whole story, brought them out uh, of Egypt. And then fast forward 40 years later, um, they're about to go into the promised land that God had promised them. And so Moses has this next generation, this younger generation, all the older generation has now died off. And now he has the younger generation that he begins to, to go through, uh, take a walk down memory lane, reminding them about the journey, reminding them how God brought them out, reminding them how God had set them free, reminding them how God had promised them a land that they would one day take, reminding them of, of the faithfulness of God, reminding them about the provision of God and the strong arm of God. And so he's beginning to unpack all that with them. And so I want you just to look at this because he's, he's telling this younger generation about what God has done and what God is about to do. And so look at this with me. It says uh, in verse number six, it says, Moses says, when we were at Mount Sinai, the Lord our God said to us, this is 12, about 11 or 12 months after Egypt, says the Lord our God said to us, you have stayed at this mountain long enough. Somebody say long enough. 
You stayed at this mountain long enough. I love this verse. It's time to break camp and move on. It's time to break camp and move on. I could just preach that right there, but we're going to keep moving. It's time to break. You've been at this spot long enough. It's time to break camp and move on. He says, go to the hill country of the Amorites and all the neighboring regions, uh, the Jordan Valley, the hill country, the western foothills, San Francisco, hello, uh, the, the Negev and the coastal plain. That's us. Go to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon and all the way to the great Euphrates River. This is what he says. He says, look, open up your eyes. Look. He says, look, I am giving you all of this land. I'm giving all this land to you, all of it. I'm giving it to you, exclamation point. And then he says this to them. So here's what you're to do. I'm giving it to you. Now you go in and occupy it. Somebody say occupy it. Go in and occupy it for it is the land the Lord God swore to give to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, uh, and Jacob to the generations there. And then look over in Deuteronomy 1, 8. If you, it, they're going to put on the screen if it's in the message. I love the way it says it's in the message. Same verse, but it says, look, God says, I've given you this land. Now go in and take it. Go in and take it. It's the land God promised to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their children after them. Here, here's the subject. If you take a notes, uh, just, just a little quick, quick two words here. Taking ground taking ground. I, I want to speak to you. I believe that God spoke to my heart and gave me a word to deposit in this house about taking ground. Now, let me just tell you right now, I'm not just preaching this word. I'm processing this word. This isn't a word that I just like, I script it up. Like this is, this is going to just encourage people and inspire people. And I'm just going to give them something. This is something I'm like right now I'm preaching to my wife and myself about taking ground. This is not something that I'm just telling you to go do. I got to smoke what I'm selling. I, I'm not as much preaching as much as I am processing. I am processing a word that God is preaching to me. And I believe he wants to preach to you. It's about taking ground. I believe that for them, for these people here, we're going to pray. But I believe for these people here, it was a specific uh, portion of land, some real estate that God had given them to go in and take. But can I tell you that you and I, we have ground to take in God's kingdom. This church, God has given this church ground and you just got to take it. God's given our church that we're going to plant by faith. God's given us ground, but we're going to have to go and take it. Not just as a church, but as individuals, each and every one of you, you have ground to take for God's glory and for people's good. The ground is not for, just for you. The ground is for God's glory and for people's good. God's called you to take ground at your workplace. God's called you to take ground at your school. God's called you to take ground in your neighborhood, in the district you live in. God has called you to take ground in the spaces and places that he has put you you were born for such a time as this. This was your time that God said, I want to pluck them out of eternity and put them in a plot of ground for them to take that ground for my glory and for people's good. God's called you to take ground. So I don't know if you're ready to take ground, but I want to take ground. Is anybody in here you believe the city of life's called to take some ground? Good, I'm in the right place. Come on, let's pray. Oh, you can clap. Don't, this isn't, this isn't, don't do a golf clap. If you're going to clap, clap. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for this beautiful house. I thank you for this beautiful church. I'm not even talking about the building. I'm talking about the people. Thank you for the spirit of this house. Thank you for the culture in this house, the leadership in this house. God, I pray that for the next few moments that you would speak to every single heart, mine included. I need a word. We need a word from heaven. We don't need just an inspiring message. We need a word from heaven to do more than challenge us, to change us from the inside out. God, will you deposit faith in this house? God, will you, will you reveal to people the ground you've called them to take? Maybe there's some people that have tried to take ground, but they feel like they've failed. God, will you just resurrect a desire to take ground for your kingdom, God, for your glory and for people's good. We bless you today, and we thank you that there are no great preachers, only the great gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, why don't you clap your hands for God's word? Is anybody in here you have uh, you have any children? Anybody in here you have any kids? You got you got some kids, okay? Uh, any of you any of you in here you are someone else's kids? Well, that would be all of us. Okay. My uh, my wife and I, as I showed you, we have two little boys. We have two sons, and uh, <clears throat> we're 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 doing our best as young parents to try to train them up, to raise them up in the ways of the Lord. 
and uh, and and we're, and we're 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 in the process right now in the kind of the heat of the moment trying to train them specifically in a particular area. We're teaching them character traits each and every month of the year. And one of the things we're trying to teach them right now is respect. We're trying to teach our kids how to respect one another, how to respect adults, how to respect God. We're, we're teaching them respect. And one of the the areas that we're finding it to be challenging to teach them as a six year old and a three year old. Is, is this, is that we're trying to teach them that to take things from someone is disrespectful. Like when you just walk up to someone and, and without asking or requesting and you just take something from them, that's disrespectful. Well, imagine if we did that as, as adults. I mean, you, you, not only is it disrespectful, you will get arrested and you will not collect $200, okay? You will, you will, you will go to jail and you will not collect $200. You, it's disrespectful to walk up to someone and take it. Last night I went and got some ice cream with some friends. Could you imagine if I'm, if I'm eating my ice cream cone and someone walked up to me and they just started licking my ice cream cone, just taking my ice cream, Bluebell ice cream. That's a southern thing. Y'all don't have that here, huh? Bluebell? Oh, come on. My girl there, she got touched by the spirit. She said, Bluebell. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's disrespectful. You don't just walk up and take something from somebody. You, you, you got you to gotta request it. You have to ask uh, for it. And, 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 and so we're teaching them this principle. We, we actually say it in our home like this. We live with open hands. We look at our kids, we say, we live open hands. The open hand is for us to, to view our possessions, the things God has given us with open hands, uh, ready and willing to give to others. But we also live with open hands, ready to receive from others. But we don't take from people. That's disrespectful. Uh, and, and, I, and I think about that as we read this text, because in the message translation, it says we're taking ground. But the truth is, is in the enemy's eyes, we're taking ground. But in God's eyes, we're simply receiving ground. You see, in, in, for the devil, the devil thinks that the ground that he's possessing and occupying is his ground. And so, yeah, in, in a sense, we're called to take ground and take something from him. If you want to disrespect the devil, just take what he thinks belongs to him. You want to disrespect God, allow the enemy to keep what already belongs to you. See, you, you've been called to receive ground. You've been called to receive ground. And so the question, as I begin to pray about this and think about this, and the, that each and every one of us have ground to take, this church has ground to take, in your life, you have ground to take for God's glory and for people's good. What will it take to take ground? And I love this story that we're going to study for just a moment today because I believe there's a few things. There's, there's many things that we could take away, many takeaways from the text. But I want to give you just three things that God's been speaking to my heart and to my wife's heart about us as we begin to step out and come to, to possess the land and the ground that God's called us to take for God's kingdom, for his glory and for people's good. I believe it's going to encourage some people in here. And so here's the first thing. Uh, I, I love uh, Golden State because we, we're three-point shooters. And so I'm going to give you three points today. I'm a three-point shooter too. I mean, the Splash Brothers, me, Steph, and Thompson, we just, we're going to shoot some threes today, okay? Here's the first one. If you're going to take ground, here's what it is. Taking ground takes faith. Somebody write that down. Say, taking ground takes faith. This may seem fundamental. This may seem super simplified. But I'm telling you, this is something that we got to catch as the people of God. The Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. I, I love it. You guys just came out of a series, I believe, called Perhaps God, right? Perhaps the Lord. I love it with Jonathan and his armor bearer. They just had a perhaps the Lord, perhaps God type faith. That's the type of uh, relationship that we have, the working relationship with God, is that we are, are called to be people of faith. We don't live by our sight. We live by our faith. We're people of faith. We're to follow God in faith. Everything that we, we are, everything that we do, everything about this walk that we have with God is characterized by this thing called faith. I mean, listen to this. We are in a religion where we worship and serve someone and someone that, that you cannot see, like you, you, you can't see God. Uh, that's why I, I love the fact that in our religion, in Christianity, we're called not to make uh, idols and images. Why? Because God, God wants to keep it a faith thing. It, it's not about what you see. It's about believing when you don't see. We live in a culture that says this. Our culture says, um, I will believe it when I see it. The Bible says, I will see it after I believe it. That we're called to believe first. We're called to be people of faith. And, and because we're called to be people of faith, you know one of the primary areas that the enemy will attack us is with fear. A spirit of fear. You see, your fear is connected to your faith. Your faith is connected to your fear. And the area that you fear the most is probably the area you trust God the least. 
the thing in the area that you fear the most, where you have the most fear, is the area you probably trust God the least. Um, here, here's the part of the story that I love is that uh, when you read Numbers 13, it appears that, um, that Moses or that God through Moses sends out these 12 spies to go to this land to go check it out, the Canaan land, the promised land. But uh, when you begin to study 40 years later, the Deuteronomy 1 account, this is what it says. Moses says, God called us to go and to take the land of Canaan, and you, the people, you came to us and said, first, let us go and see it first. Let us go and see it. What are they saying? We don't want to live by faith. We want to live by sight. We want to go see if the ground is really good. We want to go see if the Canaan land, if promised land, is really as good as God says it is. See, in Numbers, it appears as though, um, as though Moses or God gives them the directive, but that's not the case. Text should interpret text. Deuteronomy 1 says that it was the people, after they get the directive from God, the command from God to go in and to possess the land, that they come to Moses and they say, first, please, let us go and see the land first. And so Moses just kind of gives them their way. He says, okay, go. Go ahead and go see. So he sends out 12 spies. You know the story. The 12 spies go into the Canaan land. They go into the promised land. And the Bible says as they go in, they begin to scout out and explore all of the land. Then they come back, and 10 of the people, 10 of the spies, they give a bad report. This is the majority report. How many know that a lot of times, if you follow the majority, it will lead you in a bad place? The majority report comes back and reports to, to the people and says, hey, listen, the land is exactly how God said. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's a beautiful land. It's a spacious land. There's a beautiful produce and harvest. It's exactly what God said. But your butt will always get you in trouble. It's exactly as God said. But, and then they say, so the opportunity is there, but, and they start focusing on all the obstacles. Uh, but the people, there, there's tons of people in this land, the inhabitants of this land. They're so much stronger than us. They're so much bigger than us. The city devours its people. The land devours its people. And I know there's great opportunity. I know it's exactly as God said. I know that there's so much promise there. But the obstacles for us to get to the opportunity, the obstacles are great. I mean, there's even giants in the land. We look like grasshoppers. And they start spreading fear among the people of God. And in the middle of this bad report, Caleb and Joshua. I love Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua, they just literally, when you read the text, it's like they, they go, Caleb goes, hey, no, no, shut up. <laughs> it's like they just, they yell at the people and say, stop, stop spreading this fearful report. God has called us to take ground. God has called us to go in and possess the land. God has called us to go and get this promise. Don't let these men right here with their bad report keep us from the promise of God. God has gone before us. God is going with us. And it doesn't matter how big those giants are. We serve a bigger God. Let's go and get our land. I love Caleb and Joshua. It's like they just, they just say like a timeout to these, these negative pessimistic, cynical people and say, listen, you're just focusing on the obstacles. We're focusing on God. You need to stop focusing on the problems and the challenges and the limitations, and you need to focus on your limitless God. God has called us. Thank you, my girl. God has called us to go and get this land. Here's what I've discovered, that, that truly the only thing that can limit you is the way you see your limitations. It doesn't matter how, how uneducated you may be or how, uh, maybe how your lack of resources or maybe you don't feel gifted in a certain... Your limitations are not a limitation for God. We serve a limitless God. The enemy will always get us looking at our limitations and creating fear in our heart, getting, breathing over us a spirit of fear, and the whole time God is trying to breathe over us a spirit of faith. Believing Him and trusting Him and trusting that God is who He says He is. He can do what He says He can do. And if He's called us to take ground, then we can take ground because He's gone before us. He's going with us and He will give it to us. It's the God that we serve. So the, they start to argue back and forth, the ten saying, there's giants in the land. There's no way we can do this. There's, th it, this is impossible. God's brought us all the way out here to kill us. We might as well go back to Egypt. And Moses starts reminding them about the goodness of God. Today we sing about we, how, how good God is. God is so good. He is so good. He's been so faithful to us. And Moses begins to remind them, my guys, do you remember you were in Egypt, you were being oppressed, and God came in and he brought you out. He brought you out of Egypt. He's provided for you all along the way. And do you think that he's, gonna, he's brought you this far to now leave you in this space and in this place to die? He says, just remember the faithfulness of God. Listen, when the enemy starts to try to put fear on you in your life about whatever it may be in your life, you just need to stop 
and you need to turn towards God and you need to begin to remember his faithfulness in your life. Like, I'll remember how you, how you set me free from addiction. God, I'll remember how you provided whenever I thought there was no way. God, I'll remember how when I prayed that prayer for that person and you healed them. God, I'll remember you've been so faithful to me. Why am I going to doubt you now? Remember his faithfulness. Moses is trying to talk sense into him. Remember God's strong arm. God is strong. It doesn't matter about the people that are inhabiting the land. God is with us. God is with us and we can do this. And there's a tension between their fear and their faith. And anytime you're going to step out in faith, you've got to step over fear to do it. Can I tell you right now, when my wife and I think about packing up all of our, all of our stuff, selling everything we own, nothing is certain coming here. I don't know if anybody's coming with us, but God is. And while I may feel fear, I, I got to just step over. I'm, I'm not going to let fear paralyze me and my wife and our destiny. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to either believe what I preach or I don't. I believe what the word of God says or I don't. Either God is faithful or he is not. And so I'm going to go with a perhaps God than just stay in Dallas. There's a tension. There, anytime you're going to take ground for God, there will be a wrestling of fear and faith. Listen, it, it, fear, it, fear is not... It, it, it's not wrong to feel fear. It's wrong to follow fear. The Bible says that when Jesus was in the garden, he was in deep anguish. Look at that word anguish. It's agonia. It's, it's deep distress and fear. Do you know that Jesus, he felt fear? I tell people all the time, Jesus was scared to death. Literally, he was scared all the way to death. Here's what I mean by that. He felt fear, but he didn't follow fear. He said, you know what? My destiny is more important than the emotion that I'm feeling in this moment. I will not follow my emotions. Emotions are horrible leaders, but they're great followers. I'm going to follow God. So you're going to wrestle with fear and faith if you're going to take ground for God. Uh, what, what has God called you uh, to step out in faith for? Yours may not be planting a church. Yours may be stepping up your giving at this church. Yours may be starting a company, starting a business. It may be leaving one job to pursue another job. It, it may be uh, shifting careers totally. It may be writing a book. I don't know what your ground is, but I can tell you this. God's given you some ground. But the only way you'll ever realize and receive the ground God's given you is going to be appropriated by faith. I like your smile. You have a great smile back there. She's just smiling. Just smiling. God's blessing it. Here's the second one. I was hurry and rush through this. Here's the second one for you. Taking ground takes obedience. You see, at some point, your faith has got to convert into obedience. It's so easy to say, man, I believe God. I'm believing God. But when God calls you to step out in obedience, that's when the true authenticity of your faith is tested. See, faith is like a, it's like a can of paint. Its value is in its application. Let me say it again. Faith is like a can of paint. Its value is in its application. Uh, I can have a, a, a can of paint. Pa Pastor John, John can say, hey, I want to paint this back wall back here. And, and Jason and David, I want you all to take care of that. I want you all to paint it. And we could buy a can of paint from the, from the hardware store. And we could sit it on this stage. And he could come back in next week and look at us and say, boys, I told you all to paint that wall. And y'all said, yes, that y'all were going to paint the wall. And David and I look at him and say, Pastor John John, there's, 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 a, there's the paint right there. It's in the can. He's going to look at us like we're crazy. He's going to fire David. He's never going to invite me back to preach. <laughs> Why? Because the value of the paint is not in the can. It's on the wall. We can say we believe God and we have faith in the faithfulness of God and the power of God all day long. We're blue in the face. We can sing about the faithfulness of God and worship every Sunday. We can talk about the faithfulness of God and we can talk about how we're people of faith. But it's not until you actually step out in obedience that the true authenticity of your faith is tested. It's in obedience. It's in obedience. You have to obey. And see, I, I love this because we, we get a bad example of, of obedience in here, but it's a warning about what happens when you're disobedient. Because for these people, they actually begin to believe the majority report, the negative report, that there's no way that we're going to be able to take this ground. And so their fear produces unbelief. So they have unbelief rooted in fear. Fear produces unbelief, and their unbelief produces disobedience. 
And Hebrews actually says that it's wicked. It puts in a category with all types of horrible sins, murder and things. Unbelief is right there with it. When we don't believe God at his word and his promise, and we get paralyzed in fear, and we believe what the enemy is saying rather than what God is saying, and we don't step out and follow God in obedience, the Bible says we have an unbelieving heart. It's wicked. That's powerful. When I read that, I thought, when I, the days I've thought about not planting a church and just playing it safe and comfortable and being disobedient, when I realized that's not just about me not realizing my destiny, that's sin and wickedness, and that's the way God views it. It's unbelief towards him. Here's why it's so, here's why it's so bad. Watch. Uh, Psalms, I think it is, maybe it's chapter 33, says that God's plans and God's promises originate in his heart. And so when we question and, and challenge and don't believe God's plans and his promises, here's what essentially we're doing. We're questioning the heart of God. So whenever we don't follow him in obedience and do what he's called us to do and step out in faith and follow him in obedience, no matter what the outcome may be, when we choose not to do that, here's what we're really saying. God, I don't believe you. God, I don't trust you. God, you can't be trusted. God, you don't really love me. God, you want me to fail. God, you want me to fall flat on my face. God, you want me to be embarrassed. See, when we don't follow God in his plans, even when they don't make sense, when we choose not to follow his plans, when we choose not to follow it uh, in obedience towards the promises that he's given us, we're just saying, God, I don't trust you, and I, I, I challenge your heart. I'm challenging your heart today. That's what it is. That's why it's wickedness. And these people, they look God in his face through Moses, Joshua, and Caleb, and they say, we don't believe God. Therefore, we're going to stay right here in this place. i got to give it to them. Though. I, I'm being kind of hard on the children of Israel. If you back up 40 years... The Deuteronomy 1 text, it says this. For 12 months, they were sitting at Mount Sinai. They came out of Egypt. They were set free from Egypt. But listen, to this true freedom is not just what you're set free from, but what you're set free for. So they come out of Egypt, and 12 months later, they're at the base of Mount Sinai. They get the law of God. They get, they get all the commandments through Moses. God gives it to Moses. Moses comes, and he talks to him. He says, guys, we've been at this mountain long enough. It's time to break camp and move on and go get our, go get our land. And the Bible says they packed up shop and they rolled. So they were at least obedient, obedient once. i got to give it to them right there. But later on, when they get up to Canaan, when they get up to the promised land, they're completely with an unbelieving heart, filled with fear. They're disobedient in the face of God. After all of God's faithfulness, they're disobedient. And you know what it cost them? It cost them 40 years. You see, when they went out to spy the land, they went out for 40 days. 40 in the Bible is always a number for testing and a number for judgment. See, the 40 days that they went out, it wasn't, it wasn't God testing them. It was them testing God. Is, is what God said, is it really true? Is, his, is what he said about this land really true? They were testing God for 40 days. And so when the judgment came down, after God gave them chance after chance after chance to, to be obedient and to step out in faith, God said, okay, fine. You want your way? I'm going to give you your way. For every single day that you were out scouting and testing me, I'm going to give you 40 years. How do you like them apples? One year for every day. You're going to wander around in circles. And then finally, you're all going to die. And you're not going to get the promise. You're going to wander around and you will die. And all the young people under 20, they're going to get the promise that you should have got. Except for Joshua and Caleb. That was the punishment. Because if your disobedience... Another generation is going to have to get what you could have received because of your disobedience. Oh, my gosh. When I read that, I'm like, God, I don't want to live a fear-filled, unbelieving, disobedient life. And my kids have to possess what I should have possessed. I want my kids to possess the land with me. I want my kids to experience the faithfulness of God and the power of God with me. I don't want to die and my sons think about mom and dad just played it safe. They camped out in Dallas playing it safe and secure and they had their little compensation package and they were doing their little thing. I want my kids to say they were willing to leave it all and follow God in faith even when things didn't seem clear. I want my kids to say that about our story. I don't want them to have to possess what we should have possessed. Obedience. If you're going to take ground, it's going to take obedience. Hit the third thing and I'll, I'll hurry up. If you're going to take ground, it's going to take God. Taking ground takes God. What a novel idea. 
to take ground for God, you're going to have to take ground with God. It's amazing. If you talk to your pastor, he would tell you this. It's amazing how many pastors, we'll just put this on pastors. I want to put it on people. It's amazing how many pastors get a word from God to do something, and then they wrestle with fear and faith, and they say, okay, God, I'm going to choose to trust and believe you. I'm going to step over my fear. I'm going to believe you, and I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to step out, and I'm going to start a new campus. Hello, in the fall. I'm going to start a new campus. Or we're going to, we're going to launch this campaign to, to purchase a building or whatever it may be. And then watch. They heard a word from God. They trusted God. They stepped out in obedience, and then they stopped relying on God. Pastors aren't just the only people that do this. We all do this, don't we? God calls us to do something. Let, let's just say write a book. And we say, okay, God, I'm going to do that. And we begin to step out in faith and obedience, and then we stop depending and relying on him to do it. And anything you can accomplish in your flesh has no value in the kingdom of God. Everything that is accomplished in faith and trust and dependence upon God, that is what will not burn up on that day. Anything you can do in your flesh is hay and stubble, the Bible says. It will not last. On that day when we stand before God, it will be the things that were done with purity of heart, with integrity of heart, and by faith in the Son of God. Those are the things that will last. That is fruit that will remain. If you're going to take ground, it's going to take God. I love it. It's illustrated the best, I think, in the text because uh, they go to sleep that night, the people, uh, after they have said, we're not going to follow God and go possess the land. They argue back and forth. They actually said, we're going to, we're going to, let's stone Moses uh, Joshua and Caleb and find another leader to bring us back to Egypt. I mean, how wicked is that? Like, we'd rather go back to Egypt. And finally, after they hear the judgment of 40 years, you can get 40 years now, then they start crying. Oh, God, no, no. Not 40 years. 40 years is a long time. No, 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 no. Oh, God, this is not good. This is not good. This is not good. They go to sleep weeping and crying, the Bible says. The next morning, they wake up with a smile on their face and a sword on their hip. And they say, okay, we thought about it. We think it's a good idea to go into the land and possess it and take, the, take ground. We, we think it's a good idea. It's after they are faced with the consequences of their disobedience that they want to actually follow God. See, so their obedience isn't motivated out of love. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments, right? If you love, you'll obey, Jesus says. Their, their obedience is not motivated out of faith or love. It's motivated out of fear. Fear-based obedience. It's not real obedience. And God, God knows it, so God calls it out. Or Moses calls it out. He says, no, 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 it's too late, guys. Too late. You, you, were, you were disobedient. You had your chance. God was extending grace. He was extending grace, and you were disobedient. And now you're trying to say you're going to be obedient to God. Slow obedience is no obedience. Slow obedience is no obedience. It's not going to work. 40 years, you're going to wander. And they go, no, 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 no. We're going to go in now. We're going to take ground. We're going to take ground. We've come around to the idea. We're going to go and take ground. So we're going to go get it. And Moses looks at them, and he says, guys, listen to me. God is not with you anymore. If you go in and try to do this without God, you will be killed. What is the lesson he's telling them? In your own strength, your own resources, your own abilities, no matter how good you think you are, you can never in your own efforts deliver on the promises of God. Only God can deliver on his promises. You and I, and our, it doesn't matter how rich you are. It doesn't matter what your portfolio it is. It doesn't matter what your church history, your background it is. It doesn't matter what you own or possess. You cannot, and I cannot deliver on the promises of God. Only God can deliver on his promises. If God's called you to take ground, the only way you can take that ground is with God. You can't take ground for God without God. He says if you go in, you're going to go in without God, and you will die. You will surely die if you go in. One of the things that I'm beginning to learn more and more and more is that I need God. The older I get, the more I'm realizing I'm not that good. The older I get, the more I'm realizing I'm, I, I don't have the abilities that, that are going to be able to produce the results that God's called my life to produce. I can't deliver on God's promises. I can't, I can't come here and build a church. That is a ridiculous idea. I can't come here to that. But with God, all things are possible. With God, supernatural things can happen. With God, we can see 
lost people saved. We can see people that are bound up in addiction and bondage set free. We can see sick people that are dying of cancer healed by the power of God. With God, we can see those things happen. But in our own strength, my wife and I, although she is fine, okay, she's beautiful, but we're not that good. We need God. You, listen to me. You need God. If you think you don't need God, that is arrogant. God resists that. But he gives grace to the humble. What is humility? It's realizing who you are not and who God truly is. When you humble yourself and say, God, I need you. I need you for my marriage to be restored and to be saved. God, it looks like an impossible situation, but God, I believe that you can do it. I need you to do it. God, I need you to help rescue my kids out of what they're walking through and going through. They're prodigals, and I need you, God. God, I need you to turn my business around. God, I need you. When you get to that place where you realize that you need God, that's where supernatural things start to happen. That's when you start walking on water. I can tell you what, that's, that's how your pastors live. That's why they're taking ground in this city, because they, they know they need God. Let me ask you, do you know that you need God? Do, do you know that, what, that, that if God doesn't show up in a particular area, then you just, you, it, you're done for? Well, let me say it like this. Right now in your life, take a little examination. Is there any area in your life right now that you actually need God? Is there, is there any area where you're, you're, you're trusting him for something uh, to see his supernatural power demonstrated? Or are you just camped out in safety at the base of Mount Sinai? Because here's what, God sent me here to tell you this. For some, someone, this is for someone. It's time to break camp and move on. You've been living as a comfortable Christian. You need to break camp and move on. You need to step out and start believing God for some big things in your life. Don't insult God with small faith. Believe in God for little things. Believe God for impossible things. Believe that God can do miraculous things in your life. Break camp and move on. What do you need to move on into this year in 2016? What is it that you need to believe God for in 2016? Is it something in your family or in your marriage or at your workplace? What is it? That, you, that you're at a place where you say, God, in humility, I'm just saying, I need you. I'm moving into you. I'm moving into this place and this space where I need you, God. God, I need you to show up. I rely on you, and I trust in you. If you're going to take ground, it's going to take God. Here's, here's one of the most beautiful parts about this whole passage, is that when you look over in Numbers 13, the Bible says that Moses began to pick the 12 men, that would go in and spy out the land. One of the, one of the guys was Caleb, as we mentioned. The other guy was Joshua. But whenever he chose them, Joshua's name was not Joshua at the time. His name was, uh, forgive me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, my Hebrew and Greek classes in seminary, I didn't pay attention. But his name was Oshia. It's spelled like H-O-S-H-E-A, Oshia. Which means, in Hebrew, salvation. But when Moses chose Joshua, Oshia, he said, your name is no longer Oshia. Your name is Yeshua. It's Yahweh plus Oshia, which means this. Here's the translation. The Lord is my salvation. It's the same name, by the way, that we've given to Jesus. He is Yeshua. Joshua and Jesus, it's the same, it's the same name. Yeshua. The Lord is my salvation. It's as if Moses was wanting Joshua to know, listen to me. Up until this point, you've, you've kind of identified, self-identified as your own salvation. But I need you to know when you go in and get this land, you can't deliver it. The Lord, Yahweh, is your salvation. You see, as you fast forward the story, 40 years, Moses in the Bible represents the law, what we do and what we don't do, the rules and regulations, the law code. But Moses gets right up to Canaan, and the Bible says that Moses could see the land. He could only bring the people so far, but he needed another leader to bring them in. And so Joshua, Yeshua, takes the place of Moses to bring the people into a place of rest and promise and salvation. You see, you know what this is? It's, it's, it's a deeper story. It points us to the gospel. See, Moses represents the law. The law can only get you so far. The law cannot deliver righteousness. It can only define righteousness. 
The law cannot deliver on salvation and rest in the promise of God and the peace of God. The law can only point us to the promise. We need another leader. We need Yeshua. We need not, John, well, not Joshua, but we need Jesus to lead us into the place the law cannot take us. The law can only take you so far. Let me put it in, in layman's terms. You being, you being good, you being a moral person will only, only get you so far. You'll never step into the promise of salvation by being good. You can obey all the Ten Commandments. You can come to church every Sunday. You can tithe. You can give. You can get you can, everything. You can do all of it. But it's not until you put your faith and trust in Jesus to lead you into salvation through what he did on the cross. Just like what Pastor John John said earlier when we received communion. It was Jesus 2,000 years ago. He went to that cross willingly. He laid his life down for you and I so that we could put our faith and trust in him to forgive us of all of our sins, our past failure and mistakes. Give us a peace right now in our present and give us a future. Give us a hope. Give us a destiny. Jesus did that for you and I. We need Jesus, amen? Come on, why don't you bow your heads with me and we'll pray. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that your word, it's, it's fresh for our lives today. And God, there's people here today that, I think there's some people that they, they don't know what the ground is that you've called them to take. And they feel like they're just existing as a believer. They're just coasting as a believer. There's no real faith adventure that they're on. I pray today that if nothing else, you would just reveal to them the ground that you've called them to take for your glory and for people's good. God, reveal to them, God, what it is that you want them to step out and trust and believe in 2016 for you to do in their life. It may be as simple as praying for healing for somebody that they work with. God, I don't know what it is for them, but will you reveal it to them right now by your spirit? God, for some, they're, they're dealing maybe with fear about a particular area in their life. They've had a spirit of fear. But God, we thank you that your word says, for you have not given us a spirit of fear, but love, power, and sound mind. Right now, God, give them, give them your love to bring security. Give them your power to give them strength and give them a sound mind to have stability, God, so that they will not make fear-based decisions that they'll regret, but they'll make faith-based decisions, and they'll follow you in faith. God, give them a spirit of faith right now. God, I pray that any person that's dealing with fear, that your perfect love would drive out fear this Sunday morning. And God, I pray even for this church, that this church would take more ground in 2016 than they've ever taken up until this point. God, I pray for souls to be saved at this church. I pray for more canvases. God, I pray for your word to go forth. I pray for leaders to rise up. I pray for givers to begin to give sacrificially and generously and regularly. God, I pray, God, prophetically, I pray for this church that the kingdom of God would be expanded and enlarged in this city, God. God, that church planters would rise up. God, that missionaries would be sent out, God. That resources would be given to be a blessing to the nations of the earth. God, I just pray that over them, God, that they would take ground in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Come on in, won't you say amen this morning?